theyeshiva.net. L'chaim, l'chaim, taye de brider and schwester, dear brothers and sisters, chsidim, yidin, I want you, I want you for a moment to take a deep breath and to look around the room and appreciate the fact that if I'm not mistaken, we have in this room every conceivable type of Jew. <laughs> from every persuasion, from every background, from so many walks of life, from yede mahalach, from yede shnit, from yede chalois, from different movements and, organ, and communities, from different kehillas. Here's a little, little microcosm, a little foretaste of what it's going to look like when Mashiach comes. Kohol Godol Yoshuvu Heina, every single type of Jew, with every single type of Yamalka, with every single type of conviction will look at his brother and sister, embrace him or her with endless love and affection, allow the differences to melt away in the ecstasy of the oneness of the Jewish collective and individual soul. This is the power, the power of the moment. It's the power of Yutes Kislev. It's the power of the London community as I was observing the dancing before, I thought to myself, I'm from America. It's a blood libel that the English are reserved and cold. <laughs> it's an Alilas Dam. <laughs> or perhaps it was Yutas Kislev that succeeded in melting the ice and warming the cold. It was thrilling, it is thrilling and inspiring to be part of this extraordinary moment. As the prophet Yeshaya says in one of his prophecies, lift up your eyes and see your children have come from the north and the south, from the east and the west. There is no feeling, there is no experience like the experience of absolute camaraderie and brotherly love and sisterly love. King David, the Hasidim will forgive me for translating everything into English because I want everybody to understand. But it's not because I underestimate, God forbid, your understanding of the original Hebraic texts. King David says in Psalms, Hine matoiv umanoim shevet Achim gam yochad. How good and how sweet as brothers sit together. It's one of the only, one of I think two times in the entire Bible, in the entire Tanakh, that the Torah says something is good and sweet. Because usually in life there are things that are sweet, but they're not good. Good and not sweet. For example, potato chips. <laughs> cheesecake. Ice cream. Babka, marble cake, they're applauding. I'm not finished yet. <laughs> they heard babka, they got excited. That's dessert, soon. These are very sweet foods. Somebody delivered today to my hotel a large honey cake, a large honey cake, a brownie muffin, cinnamon buns. I was hungry, but I looked at the ingredients. It was deadly. It was sweet, but by no means was it good. There are other things that are good. Spinach, <laughs> lettuce, wheatgrass juice, <laughs> soybeans. Extremely good, ask your nutritionist. But sweet? Not quite, at least not according to my primitive American taste buds. Says David HaMelech, There are a few things in life 
that are both sweet, geschmack, but they're also good. And one of those few gifts is when brothers sit together, when sisters t sit together, when the external differences caused by externalities melt away and souls dance in unison. First of all, it's good. But in addition to that, it's also geschmack. It's delightful. It's pleasant. It feels right. It resonates. It's just when you know that this is the way it was supposed to be. It's returning back to a pristine state of innocence, pre-politics, pre-corruption, pre-toxicity. So Yeshaya says, lift up your eyes and see that your children have come from everywhere. And it's moving to see every conceivable type of Jew in this room here without judgmentalism. It's not like the people with the streimlach on Shabbos feel more comfortable than the people with the little kippot or conversely. Everybody feels at home because when you're with your brothers, when you're with your sisters, when the neshamas, when souls are celebrating, when you're with Hashem, when you're with God, says Rashi, when Jews are united, God is our king. And when Jews, God forbid, are not united, imagine God cannot call himself the king because he himself becomes fragmented. So for this I say to you, Mazel Tov, L'chaim, Gut Yom Tov, Shehechiyonu, V'kimonu, V'giyonu L'zmanazah, a new horizon has descended upon the Jewish people in recent years, one that embraces and welcomes a deeper consciousness of unity, of depth, and of oneness. L'chaim, my dear Yidin, L'chaim, my dear friends, L'chaim, dear brothers and sisters, please join me, L'chaim, L'chaim, L'chaim. You know, I, a number of years ago, two summers ago, I took a trip to the island in St. Petersburg where the Tsar imprisoned the Baal HaGa'ula, the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shneir Zalman, the day after Sukkot, 1798. They put him in a prison that was secured for capital crime and for the most heinous criminals in Tsarist Russia. Like we have by us Alcatraz. This was Russia's Alcatraz. You cannot run away from there. S surrounded all around by water. The only way to get out is by boat or swimming many miles. That's where they imprisoned this great holy sage, the Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe. And I went to see the place. I was curious, not only with my mind, but with my heart. I wanted to see it. And I went there. It was for me, somebody who has dedicated much of my life to learn and to share and to teach the writings and the works of the Alter Rebbe. I have privileged for years to give every single morning a class in the writings of the Balatanya, Taira Er, Lakuta Taira, Tanya, his discourses, where I live in Munsi, where we have every morning around 100 or 200 people who come quite early in the morning to learn with us for many years. It was an emotional experience for me to see this place where they imprisoned this great man. And I went into one of the cells tiny cells, many people were tortured, many people died there. He himself thought he's going to die there. And in my imagination, I went back two centuries exactly, 220 years, a little more than two centuries, to that day when the Alter Rebbe, whose picture you all know, the painting of Rabbi Shneir Zalman, it was taken while he was in prison. He lived in Lyazna in Belarus in a little town, it's a few years before the science of photography 
was invented. At that time, there had to be paintings. Nobody thought of painting and depicting a picture of this man. We don't have a painting of Rashi. We don't have a painting of Rabbi Akiva. Well, some say we have an image of the Ramba, Maimonides, it's disputed. But even in the 1700s, this was not popular besides a few exceptions. But in prison, it was a Gentile who was so impressed by his visage that he depicted it. And anybody who ever saw the image of the Alter Rebbe, everybody's familiar with the painting, you could see a little bit of what type of person he was, and you have to understand the circumstances. He was in a cell. He was deprived of the most basic human needs. He was oppressed. His future was unknown. He had nobody. He completely did not know. He didn't even have a window to be able to see if it's day or night. He was in complete isolation, and that's what he looked like during those days, during those nights in prison. And I imagined the scene Tuesday afternoon. It was Tuesday early evening, Yutes Kislev, the 19th of Kislev, 5659 or 1798, when he emerged from that island, when he emerged from that fortress in Petersburg. And with a ship, he was transported to the main city of Petersburg, which you could still observe today, taken by, his, taken by the guards to be dropped off, supposedly, in the home of one of his Hasidim. Whoever observed it at the time, the Tsar was in his full power. It was Paul, I believe, Tsar Paul at the time. He was in his full power, and he was a rabbi who was accused of, A, assisting the Turkish government in Palestine, and Turkey was hostile to Russia. A second accusation was that al is trying to overthrow the Tsarist regime and take over. In fact, when he was in prison, they sent in what we would call today a psychologist. Then it wasn't called a psychologist. It was an expert on the soul to figure out if he wants to become the next czar. And the man spoke to him and interviewed him. And at the end, he said, you have infinite ambitions. Don't you crave malchus? Don't you crave royalty? Which, of course, would mean that he's a dangerous man. And the Alter Rebbe looked at him. And he said, yeah, 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 I crave malchus, I crave royalty, I crave malchus de ein soif baruchu. I crave to be one with the malchus, with the royalty of the infinite one. Blessed be he, the throne of the Tsar will not do it. I crave to be one with infinity, that is my craving for malchus. And so the Tsar investigates this rabbi, this rebbe, and concludes that he's innocent, it was fascinating. Only in recent years, when the walls of communism came, crumb came crumbling down, did we gain access to the archives of the regime where we could discover the handwritten documents and letters and answers that Alter Rebbe wrote during his imprisonment. You see, they posed to him 22 questions about the basic ideas of his theology of the world of Hasidism, of Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, but particularly the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, his Rebbe's Rebbe, who passed away in 1760, the Baal Shem Tov, when the Alter Rebbe was 15, and the Baal Shem Tov left his successor, the Maggid of Mizrich, whose yard site is tonight, and the Shabbos before the Maggid died, passed away, he turned to the Alter Rebbe and he said, Yutes Kislev is our celebration. Unzer Hilula, he passed away that day, and decades later, the Alter Rebbe was emancipated that day. And he was the person chosen to defend these teachings. And they asked him 22 questions. In Chabad, there was a tradition that he answered them in Hebrew, and they were sent to Vilna to be translated into Russian, and then brought back to the Tsar and his ministers to be able to examine. But there was no concrete evidence for this. In the 1990s, after Gorbachev, after communism fell, they discovered what was the most original in quantity, the greatest manuscripts of the Alter Rebbe's writing, which were mostly lost because of a major fire in his home in Liadi in the early 1800s, but this was in the, in, the, in the government, so it was preserved. Pages and pages and pages of his original writings in prison to explain his position, and he's explaining this to Gentiles in the late 1700s, 
defending himself about everything. What he believes about money, business, marriage, prayer, study, social life, politics, community. Writing to Gentiles in a beautiful, beautiful Hebrew that would later be translated. And it's obviously that he's trying to explain that he's an innocent person. I am an innocent man. It's an extraordinary document because it's, the Alter Rebbe usually writes to his disciples who are scholars, who are Jewish, who are involved in Yiddishkeit. Here, he's writing to a completely different audience, a non-Jewish audience. When he goes out and he is free at last, I try to depict the scene. The rabbi is innocent and he goes out and for the czar, life moved on. It was a celebration for Hasidim who lived in Russia, who were completely subjugated to the czarist regime, which was very harsh and very tough with the Jewish people. Different czars, different moods, different milieus, different edicts, but the common denominator of Russian Jewry is a story of persecution, misery, and agony. Hasidim danced, Hasidim celebrated, other Jews celebrated. It was a monumental victory. But if somebody was observing it, they would think, it's a small story in the scheme of global events. 220 years pass, and you go back to Russia today, and you ask yourself one question. Where is Paul? Where is Catherine? Where is Alexander? Where is Peter the Great? Where is Nicholas I? Where is Nicholas II? You remember your Russian history? Okay. Where is Nicholas I? Where is Nicholas II? Where is the Romanov dynasty? And the answer is in Wikipedia. <laughs> Each of them has an entry in Wikipedia. And if you Google right now, you can edit them. <laughs> and send them my regards and our love right here on Yutis Kislev. And now I ask you an alternate question, an alternative question. How many celebrations are taking place this Yutis Kislev in the former USSR, in the country where it happened? I was not lazy. I called up one of my dear friends in Lubavitch World Headquarters. I texted him, actually. <laughs> It was easier. And I asked him the question. I wanted to know, I wanted to know accurately, not hearsay or anecdotal evidence, how many Yutas Kislev celebrations, how many gatherings like this, smaller numbers, larger numbers, are taking place in Petersburg, in Moscow, in Belarus, in Lithuania, from Uzbekistan, Arbidijan, Siberia. Siberia has 11 time zones. Siberia has 11 time I don't know if you know that Siberia is a fifth of the planet, which is why nobody can ever win a war against Russia, because they always retreat. <laughs> and they always have place to retreat more and more and more. Napoleon failed to understand this. Hitler failed to understand this, thank God. They both were defeated by the size. In Russia, this Yutas Kislev, approximately 400 Fabrengens and celebrations are taking place. <laughs> Appreciate the magnitude of the miracle, not only of Jewish survival, but where Jewish existence has reached to this very day. And when I think about it, I remember that moment. I once observed a photograph and I couldn't understand it. A menorah with a swastika in the background. And I couldn't understand who would take a picture of a menorah and a decoration in the background. You need some nice decoration for your menorah, right? So you have a swastika. Like what type of insanity must enter into your psyche to take such a picture? It, it, it took my breath away. And I started to examine the background of this picture, and I discovered its origin. It's a picture, you can Google it later. 
It happened December 31, 1932. The eighth night of Hanukkah fell out on Friday night. Shabbos was the eighth night of Hanukkah. There's a city in Germany called Kiel, Germany, K-I-E-L. The rabbi was Rabbi Akiva Baruch Posner. His wife, Rachel Posner. She set up the menorah on the window ledge for her husband to light the menorah a few minutes before Shabbos. It happened to be across the street was the headquarters of the Nazi party with the Nazi flag draped over the building, a large swastika. As he lit the menorah, eight candles were glowing, and in the background, you could see a huge swastika. Rachel Posner felt this was a surreal moment. It was almost the contrast between two world orders came into a clash in the most vivid way, and she decided to photograph the moment. She took out her camera, she took a picture, she snapped a picture. She ran to light Shabbos candles because in a few minutes would be sunset as Shabbos would descend over the horizon of Kiel, Germany, December 31, 32, the eighth night of Hanukkah. She developed the film. On the back side of the picture, she wrote these words, which I've seen. I'll translate it from German into English. Hanukkah. 1932, Judah will die, thus the flag says. Judah will live forever, thus the lights answer. Indeed, the first half of her observation came so close to be authenticated. Only a few days later, were the elections in Germany that brought Adolf Hitler to power. It was January 30th, 1933, when Hitler, Yemach Shemoy became the chancellor of Germany. And over the next 15 years, the light of Judah came so close to be extinguished. And then a few days ago, I get a message from my friend. He was a classmate in yeshiva. He is the chief rabbi of Berlin. His name is Rabbi Yehuda Tachtel. And he told me that he was invited by the president of Germany for an audience. And when he walked into the office of Germany's president, Frank Walter Steinmeier, the president of Germany turned to him and said, Rabbi Tachtel, this is the time when we're observing the 80th anniversary since Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht broke out in November 1938, exactly 80 years ago. How do you think Germany should commemorate the onset of the Holocaust eight decades ago? This was a big question for Rabbi Tachtel. So the president of Germany, Frank Walter Steinmeier, turns to the chief rabbi of Berlin and says, you were sent here by the Lubavitcher Rebbe. What would the Lubavitcher Rebbe say? How should Germany commemorate the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht? Rabbi Tachtel said, Mr. President, the Rebbe would always say, that in the place where the greatest darkness was unleashed, we must introduce the most powerful light, unprecedented. Because if that was the place of the greatest darkness, the light must at least be commensurate with the darkness and even more, which means that this must be a time when Germany dedicates itself to introduce the greatest light. The president turns to him and says, Rabbi, great idea. I want our country to sponsor the largest menorah this Hanukkah, and I want it to stand at the Brandenburg Gate in the spot where my predecessor, where Adolf Hitler stood 
and gave some of, some of his most fiery, passionate presentations, invigorating the German people to a life of hate, genocide, murder, violence, and rivers of blood to rid the world from the bacteria of the Jewish people. The very same place where parades took place and millions of Hitler Jugend, millions of German youth stood and made the infamous salute that I will not replicate, hail, etc. Where the Nazi Germany displayed its majestic splendor, its organization, its structure. They were brilliant with Goebbels' propaganda. Joseph Goebbels' propaganda, they were brilliant at that. I want in this place, you should put up the largest menorah because didn't your Rebbe say, we need the greatest light in the place of the greatest darkness. Rabbi Techtel said, Mr. President, I'm game. And when I heard this from Rabbi Techtel, he shared this with me, as the preparations are being made, I looked back at that picture. And I discovered that in Haifa lives a Jew. His name is Yehuda Manzabach. He's a grandson of Rachel and Rabbi Akiva Baruch Posner. And each Hanukkah, he lights a menorah. Which menorah does he light? The menorah that his grandfather and grandmother lit in Kiel in December 32. He puts it on his ledge on the window in Haifa. And every year his children and grandchildren stand around him. And he takes out the picture, the original picture that he bequeathed from his grandmother. And he reads to them the script, the notes of his grandmother. Judah will die, thus says the flag. Judah will live forever. Or in German, that Leben in that Leben in Thus say the lights. This Hanukkah again, he will take out the menorah and take out the picture, as his grandchildren will observe the scene. And when you look at that menorah today, and you look at the Brandenburg Gate, this Hanukkah, you now have to ask a question: Who was right, the flag? or the lights. In 1932, Rachel Posner could have not seen the bleak and dark future of what will befall her community, German jury, and East European jury, decimated almost completely. And yet, she had an intuition. She had that inner, what, let's use a German word, she had a Spitzenfingergefühl. Anybody knows what that means? I learned this word from my father. A spitzen finger gefil. It means the sixth sense, the feel at the edge of your finger. As a Jew, she knew Netzach Yisrael lo Yishakir. The eternity of Israel is not a lie. God will not lie. The flame will never be extinguished. And therefore, she knew those little eight. Humble, small, tiny lights will have to withstand the storm, strongest of winds, the most ferocious of storms, the greatest nights of darkness that would befall humanity and the Jewish people. But those eight lights will not only survive, they will thrive. And literally 86 years later, the flag is history. Sad and tragic, unspeakable history. But history that belongs in the dustbin. Now, do you know how many public Hanukkah menorahs are going to be lit this coming Hanukkah? You see, I'm not lazy. <laughs> in 82 countries, in 50 states, in many of them dozens of menorahs, close to 45,000 public Hanukkah menorahs. And I'll never forget, I'll never forget, when I was a boy, I was 15, the Rebbe, the Lubavitch Rebbe was a very self-critical person. 
People don't even know how introspective and self-critical he was. And one year on the Shabbos before Hanukkah, he publicly said that he feels like a failure. My father, my late father, was a journalist. He wrote an article in his newspaper, the Yiddish newspaper, the Algemeine Journal. He said, <laughs> my father was an interesting guy. He says, last Shabbos, the Lubavitcher Rebbe claimed that he was a failure. I maintain that he's wrong. I completely disagree with him. Now, I was an innocent kid. I said, Tati, how do you write like this? You disagree with the Rebbe? He smiled. He didn't even say anything. It was his way of saying, why, why, you'll also mature one day. And he said, I'll tell you why he's wrong. He said, I met a Jew from Des Moines, Iowa. Des Moines, Iowa. Okay? And he tells me, he came to Brooklyn to celebrate Shabbos. I asked him, what brings you here? He said it was Hanukkah, holiday season in America. And he was walking, very assimilated Jew. And the Chabad ambassador to Des Moines, Iowa, who's also a cousin of mine, which is how this man ended up in my home, put up a menorah. And he stops and he sees a menorah, middle of the night burning. And I remember those words, he was in our dining room in Brooklyn and he says, and I just couldn't help break out in a smile that I was Jewish. And for the first time in my life, I felt good about being Jewish in Des Moines, Iowa. And my father wrote, the Lubavitcher Rebbe doesn't realize that this is not a failure. That a few decades after the Holocaust, to give a secular assimilated Jew in Des Moines, Iowa the feeling, you're not the nation hunted down by Hitler and by Nasrallah and by Rouhani and by Ahmadinejad. You're the nation loved by God, embraced by destiny to be ambassadors of love, light, and hope. He says, that's not a failure. And when I look at the Hanukkah at Brandenburg Gate, I say, Rachel Posner was right. And so, history has its own way of describing reality. Just its own way. In 1798, a rabbi came out of prison. In 2018, four, more than 400 in Russia alone combined the world, Jews the world over, celebrate this great Chag HaGorula, this great celebration of redemption just a few years just a few days before Hanukkah. And as I told the women in Stamford Hill a few hours ago, earlier this morning, I said, it's not only that we like to survive our enemies. That's not a big deal. We also like to turn them into something delicious. So we took Haman and we turned him into a hamantash. We took Antiochus and we turned him into a latke. We took Pharaoh and we turned him into a matzah ball. And even those of you who don't eat gebrachts, on the last night of Pesach, Parai becomes your matzah ball. Last year I was in Brooklyn College on Hanukkah. An Irish person wanted to know, Rabbi, why do you guys eat so many latkes and donuts on Hanukkah? I really was not in the mood of giving the whole oil thing. It was too oily of an explanation for me. I needed something simple. I said it's very obvious. Hanukkah celebrates the victory of the Jewish people over the Greeks. The Greeks were obsessed by four things. Looks, fashion, sports, athleticism. So we eat abundant latkes <laughs> and donuts to make sure that we never ever will look like them. The president of Brooklyn College somehow liked the explanation, especially I love when my explanations and teachings are accompanied with a living example. <clears throat> but I'm gonna work on it, I'm gonna work on it. God willing, next time this Hanukkah, I'm gonna try to behave very well and for once listen to my good wife <clears throat> who has the right perspective on latkes and donuts, and always reminds me they belong to Antiochus, <laughs> not to you. <laughs> I 
But tonight, I think, we have to go one step deeper and ask, what is it that happened on that Tuesday in 1798? I mean, we're all happy that Al Rebbe came out of prison. What's its relevance today? What's its relevance today? And I'm going to tell you here an instinct. I can't tell you that this is scientifically proven. It's not. But I asked myself earlier a question. Why was everybody dancing with such enthusiasm in both sections? I know about this section because the women asked me to leave the pulpit. <laughs> Why was everybody dancing so enthusiastically? There was almost an energy that comes from a place that you can't always identify. It's that energy that I want to address because I think it's very genuine. Why is Yutes Kislev celebrated in hundreds and hundreds of homes, synagogues, community centers, Hasidim and non-Hasidim, Chabadniks and non-Chabadniks, the world over? There are three teachings that the Alter Rebbe introduced into Judaism. Three ideas that he emphasized, that he brought out, that he elaborated upon, that he turned into hallmarks of Yiddishkeit, through which he allowed us to expand our paradigms, not change our paradigms, but expand our paradigms, to expand our horizons. Three ideas I'm going to focus on out of many, because I see these three out of many as fundamental to three challenges that all of us in this room face today. And it's fascinating how in the late 1700s, the Jewish world was changing rapidly. There's no way you can understand the contemporary Jewish world if you don't know what happened 200, 250 years ago in the Jewish world. All the divisions in the Jewish world today can be traced back to the events of those decades in the mid-1700s. The denominations, the groups, the ideological differences, the right-wingers and the left-wings, more religious, less religious, right-wing, centrist, reform, conservative, orthodox, misorati, conservadox, right-wing facing left, centrist facing right, centrist facing left, bagel and lock Jews, spiritual but not religious Jews, religious but not spiritual, physical but not religious and not spiritual, Gulf Jews, sushi Jews, crab Jews, Meditation Jews, Transcendental Jews, Kugel Jews, Chalupzas Jews, Chinese food Jews, any category of Judaism and what it means to you today, Gulf, Bingo, etc., etc., is all traced back to those dramatic years when emancipation, enlightenment crumbled the world of the ghetto and the Jewish people faced an entirely new reality that would change its face to this very day, not only in Britain, but in the entire diaspora and the world over wherever Jews are. And these are three fundamental teachings that the Baal Shem Tov taught and his students expounded. And the Alter Rebbe, who became the chief interpreter of the world of esoteric Jewish mysticism through a movement and a perspective he called Chabad, which is an acronym for Chachma Bina Das, conception, comprehension, application, because of his commitment that Jewish ideas, Jewish wisdom, Jewish passion must be understood, internalized, meditated upon, studied, taught, explained, elaborated upon. Not only nuggets of wisdom, not only inspirational tidbits, not only nice cute songs and wonderful feasts, but a real program for life. He synthesized the rational and mystical and halachic streams of Torah into a unified comprehensive program for life. I want to focus on three teachings very briefly that I think can illuminate our world, our communities, our homes, our marriages, our intimate lives, our psychological struggles, and our stress in this very day. Issue number one, one of the greatest challenges that faced Jews in the 1700s and still faces us today is, what is the role of the Jewish people in a large, open world? For thousands of years, we were isolated, we were segregated. You were forced to be Jewish whether you liked it or you didn't. You were born a Jew and you died a Jew and nobody asked you. Today is from the first times in history where we were granted real freedom. 
Every single person, I shouldn't say every, almost every single person sitting here in this room has choices to make every single day about identity, about destiny. Who am I and what do I want to be? What is the role of this tiny little nation called Klal Yisrael? In a large world, we don't even constitute a quarter of 1% of civilization. Did you get that? Not even a quarter of 1% of humanity. As somebody once said, the, Jewish, the number of Jewish people is less than a statistical error in a Chinese census. <laughs> there are 1.4 billion Chinese. As I'm talking, another million were born. <laughs> By the time I'm done, another million. And we're fighting for every Jew, literally. We have 14, 15, maybe 15 and a half million Jews came year boom. As long as Jews were hunted down in anti-Semitism, isolated, it was no question. But in the days of the Alter Rebbe, and then it wasn't even authentic. In today's day and age, the real question is, what is our role in this world? And here he gave us one of the most beautiful teachings that always coincides with this time of the year in the portion of Ayeshev to understand what was the conflict between Joseph and his brothers. At first glance, they were just jealous of a spoiled baby brother who got a cashmere colorful sweater from his father. That's why you have to throw your brother into a pit. Go to Macy's or Century, I don't know what you have here. Go to a store and buy yourself a 290 pounds on sale, a wonderful colorful cashmere tunic. You don't throw your brother into a pit because Tati has bought him a colorful tunic over you. Your brother comes to you and says, I have a dream. The sun is bowing down to me and I would tell my brother, dream on. <laughs> I don't have to throw him into a pit and sell him into slavery. I have a dream. Your sheaves will bow down to me. And I would say, May it be in an auspicious time. Continue dreaming. And when you wake up from your dreams, I have a great therapist <laughs> in gold is green who has done wonders. <laughs> Obviously, says the Alter Rebbe, the conflict was profound. If it was recorded in the Torah and if it affected the destiny of Israel and the first family of the Jewish people, this wasn't a simple conflict. And the conflict was a very profound one indeed. The brothers of Joseph felt that Judaism can survive and thrive only in isolation. They were shepherds because as shepherds, they were removed from the hustle and bustle of urban life. They spent time in the wilderness, pasturing, grazing their flock around water, around nature. It's always in isolation where you could connect with the spiritual energy of the cosmos. Joseph! was the first Jew to dream about changing the world, transforming the landscape of the planet. He's dreaming about economics. He will be the visionary for agricultural future, which was then the pseudonym for real estate today. Jews are not so into farming today for whatever reason. But then farming was the source of sustenance. That's not enough. The sun and the moon and the stars will bow down to him. He will be the visionary. Not only will he be an expert in agriculture, he'll be an expert in astronomy and in vision and in philosophy. And the brothers look at him and they say, as we say in Yiddish, Du bist der schwarze Schepsele in der Mishpuche. You're the black sheep in the family. This is not Judaism. You are a danger to Judaism. Your visions are alien to Judaism. From their perspective, they're actually right. There are different streams in Jewish life. It's something that Jews still don't understand. There are different perspectives and they are all legitimate. The Talmud said it beautifully. These and these are both the words of the living God. But somehow we have an issue with this. It's hard for us to respect other people if they have different paths and different journeys. There's no need to hate or mistrust. Every marriage thrives that way. I promise you. The only perfect families I know are the families I don't know well. <laughs> I once heard myself from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he said, when two Jews meet, what do they say? One says, Shalom Aleichem. The second one says, Aleichem Shalom. Peace unto you, unto you peace. 
Why the opposite response? Why not? Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. Imagine in English, I say, good evening. And you say, evening good. How are you? You are how? What's up? Up what? Shigav toit. This guy needs help. And yet in Hebrew, we do it constantly. Shalom Aleichem, Aleichem Shalom. And the Rebbe, who had a wonderful sense of humor, said, because when two Jews meet, even before they begin a conversation, the first thing that they have to establish is that they disagree. <laughs> I say to you, Shalom Aleichem, and you say, Neh, 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 Kfira, because it's a via voice, it's not Shalom Aleichem, it's Aleichem Shalom. Now that we establish that we disagree, maybe we could now begin a dialogue. There's a fellow Kabbalist in New York, his name is Jackie Mason. <laughs> he repeats most of my jokes. So I once, <laughs> I once heard from him, I once had the privilege of hearing from him, I had a chat with him, that uh, if two Jews meet and within three minutes they don't establish a family connection, one of them is not Jewish. He's right. I have the privilege of traveling the world wherever I meet anybody. I come to London, I meet somebody in the airport. You must be related to me. My cousin's second mother-in-law, twice removed, etc. There's always... But I would add, if two Jews meet them within five minutes, there's no disagreement. One of them is probably not Jewish. The brothers of Joseph really had a different path. But Joseph was born with a soul that was destined to a completely different journey. And indeed, when he descends to Egypt and he becomes the prime minister of the superpower of the world and he saves his entire family and the entire Jewish people from famine and when he meets his brothers 22 years later, he tells his brothers, go back to my father and tell him, Samani Eloikim la'odin al kol Eretz Mitzrayim. God has made me a master over the totality of Egypt. And the commentators say, that's the nachas that your father Jacob wants to hear? That you became the viceroy of Egypt? You think Jacob cares about that? Go tell my father that I didn't miss Rabbeinu Tam's tefillin. Go tell my father that a day didn't pass by that I didn't learn a blot Gemara. Go tell my father that I remained Ayid. You're going to impress Jacob, Ishtam, Yosheh Holim, the quiet student of Torah, that you became the viceroy of Egypt. He couldn't care less that you graduated Harvard or Oxford with honors. Tell him about what he cares. And the holy Hasidic master of Yisrael of Ruzhin said, we misunderstand the verse. Joseph said, go tell my father, Samani Eloikim la'odoin al kaleretz mitzrayim. I turned God into the ruler of Egypt. Joseph's destiny was to be able to reveal that the entire world and even the very entity of Egyptian culture, economics, the very entity of the physical material world ultimately was also seeking oneness. Ultimately the entire universe, the entire planet needed to find its soul and be realigned with its true core. The ultimate vision of Judaism from Joseph's perspective was not that Jews create a segregated cocoon where they practice their tribal traditions and rituals, notwithstanding that importance and that vital contribution of his brothers. But in his mind, the power of Yiddishkeit was to ultimately l'sakein oilam b'malchus shindalad yud, to change the world. It wasn't easy for his brothers. They looked at Joseph and they said, his philosophy is the closest thing to Judaism. They looked at Joseph and they said, this is not the real thing. This is dangerous. And just to show you how Jewish history develops, I'm going to say this very briefly for those who learned Af Yoimi and are holding Masechta Menachis and you still remember Masechta Zvachim. I hope so. So you'll remember that Zvachim, page 116, gives us a profound law. 
In Jerusalem, you can eat all of the sacrifices of the Beis HaMikdash only inside the walls. As long as you're in the walls of Jerusalem, you can eat the sacred offerings. If you took it out of the walls, Nifsal B'yotze, you have to burn it. That's in Jerusalem. What about in Shiloh? When the tabernacle stood in Shiloh for 369 years, there was no wall. What was the parameter? What was the border for the offerings? And the answer is, Shiloh Niskadr Beroya. Wherever you are, if you could see the tabernacle, even if you're 50 miles away, it's a sunny day in Israel, and you could see it, you can eat offerings wherever you are. Judah, Yehuda had the territory of Jerusalem. Yosef Joseph had the territory of Shiloh. Yehuda says Jews need to be inside a wall. That's how we can maintain our holiness. It's a perspective. It's an important perspective. Joseph said, I have another mission. Even when the walls crumble, wherever you are in the world, you could be in the depth of an Egypt. As long as you can open your eyes and see the base of Mikdash, as long as we can effing in the Oigen, as long as you can change your paradigm, develop perspective, and put on a pair of glasses that allows you to see as my father saw in that midnight dream, in the mystical night, the divine presence is in this very, very space. Somebody once asked me if there is humor in the Bible. Is there humor in the Bible? What would you say? Huh? <laughs> There's a lot of humor. There's a lot of humor. But I'll tell you one of the most humorous moments in the entire Torah. Very briefly. Judah, Yehuda, accused Joseph of compromising Judaism. And that's why he says, why should we leave him in a pit? Let's sell him. Let him go to Egypt. Judah was saying something very wise. You don't win an argument by killing your opponent. You win an argument by proving your opponent wrong. We won't win the argument with Joseph by killing him. This is Nishkin Kunz. You know how we'll win the argument? He likes the world. As they say in Yiddish, Zola essen von der Kasha was eretoyem given. Let him eat that food that he loves. Let him go down to Egypt and let him see that the grass is not greener on the other side. Indeed, Joseph went down to Egypt. What's the next scene in the Torah? The next scene in the Torah is Yehuda, the great king, the one who represented Jewish segregation and isolation. However you explain the story, falls prey to the temptations of a woman he doesn't know is his daughter-in-law, Tamar. And what's the next scene? Joseph in the depth of depraved Egypt, is tempted by another woman, the wife of Potiphar. And he refuses, as he says, In the midst of moral depravity, he knows that God is here because he sees. With his eyes, he could see divinity. He could see Yaakov. And that's why in his Kaddish Biroya, he was sanctified with vision. As long as you could see the tabernacle of Shiloh, you can eat the offerings here, even outside of the city of Shiloh. One of the great students of the Magid was the Bas Ayin Reb Avram of Avruch. And he says, when Jacob sends Joseph to his brothers, he says, L'chavesh, l'chacha, let me send you to your brothers because they are shepherding Bishchem. They are shepherding in the city of Shechem. Vayoy meloi. And Joseph says, he nani. And the commentators say, what's the loi to him? Obviously, this is the conversation. It never says loi. Hashem calls to Avram, vayoy he nani. Jacob tells Joseph, go to Shechem, vayoy he nani. What's vayoy loi? Says the Basayin Gewalt. Open your hearts. Bishchem is an acronym 
Baruch Shem Kvoid Malchusai. Jacob sent Joseph, he said, Let's go to your brothers in Shechem. Baruch Shem Kvoid Malchusai. To expand God's kingdom. Vayoymer Loy. Loy is the acronym. Loylam Voed. Joseph's response is. It's not enough to have Baruch Shem Kivoid Malchuso in heaven. Lo'olam Voed. Holiness must be revealed in the earth, in the very midst of day to day material life. One can find integration. It's not easy. For this, you need a colorful sweater. Most people, when they face diversity, it's easy to become compartmentalized and confused. Joseph was empowered by Jacob to look at diversity and see that there is a tapestry of unity that is being developed. This was the uniqueness of Joseph. And it's why Jacob always preserved that vision. Because he knew that his vision is instrumental for Jewish survival. And today... As we live in freedom, we live in emancipation, and we have to thank God for the liberties that we are given. It is this type of perspective and paradigm that can teach the Jewish people today, don't be afraid of the world. On the contrary, as the Alter Rebbe says again and again in one way or another, the whole world yearns to place its mouth on your mouth. And declare together, Yisgadal v'yisgadash shmei Raba. But there's another component that is so vital today. And this has to do with a little story. And for this story, you have to mamash tune in. There was a Jew, his name was Reb Shmuel Munkus. Reb Shmuel Munkus became one of the great disciples of the Alter Rebbe. But their first encounter was nothing but very strange. And this is how it happened. The Rebbe lived in a little town in Belarus, which you could visit. It's called Lyazhna. Not much there, but the town is there. Reb Shmuel Munkus came to Lyazhna. He was looking for the Alter Rebbe. He wanted to become his disciple. Today, how do you become somebody's disciple? Huh? How do you become somebody's disciple? The right way is, you go in the middle of the night to Lyazhna, or wherever it is. You knock on the door, <laughs> and that's what he did. He knocked on the door. He found one house where there was light. He assumed it's the Alter Rebbe's house. He knocked on the door. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. The Alter Rebbe opened the door. Reb Shmuel Munkus is standing right there. And here is what happens. The Alter Rebbe turns to Reb Shmuel Munkus, and he says, Shalom Aleichem. <laughs> Shalom. How can I help you? Three o'clock in the morning. Reb Shmuel Munkus sees the Alter Rebbe and he says, Ich such a Platz zu nechtiken. I'm searching for a place to stay over. The Alter Rebbe says, Du kommst in Mittnacht? You come in the middle of the night? And Reb Shmuel says, and I have said that by a Rebbe is no dark night. And I thought that by a real Rebbe, there's no darkness, there's no night. He says, it's the middle of the night. Why do you come here? He says, I want to be in this home. He says, you couldn't find any other home? He tells the Rebbe, you're not a Jewish home, you can't let me in. The Alter Rebbe says, I don't think this home is for you. You should search for another home. Reb Shmuel Munkus says, I want this home. He says, either you leave on your own. If not, I quote, de goy never de I have a strong Gentile in my house. He helps out. They used to call them Ivan. It was always this classic Ivan guy. You know, the Shabbos guy. He said, if you don't leave, I'm going to call him, and he will throw you out of the house. Reb Shmuel Munkus started to cry, and he said, Rebbe, mein goy is a sach starker wie dein goy. 
Mine is far more powerful than yours. The Alter Rebbe was quiet. He kept the door open, and Rabbi Shmuel Munkas became one of his greatest, greatest disciples. What is this story all about? What type of exchange is this? Come on. A Jewish home, you let somebody in at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to call my Gentile, go to somebody else's house, you don't belong here, I'm going to throw you out. And then he says, oh, mine is strong. It's almost like my tati is stronger than your tati. You remember those conversations? Okay, now you can come to my house. I, for this you have to understand how a Rebbe and a Chassid communicate. They don't only communicate with words. They communicate with soul, with Yechidish HaBenefesh, with the essence of their existence. This was a very deep conversation, and it goes to one of the most important teachings of the Baal Shem Tev, his students and his disciples, and the Alter Rebbe. Reb Shmuel Munkis comes to the Alter Rebbe and he says, I want to be by you, I want to be your disciple. He says, it's the middle of the night, why are you coming? This is a psychological exchange. He says, I thought by you there's no night, there's no darkness. The Rebbe says, if so, this home is not for you. Why? Ay, 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 ay. Many people throughout Jewish history understood that the path to spirituality is a path that transcends darkness. There's no night, there's no darkness, there's only day, there's only brightness. How many emails do I get? How many encounters do I have where fine young men and women cry and say, when will I get rid of all the toxicity in my spirit? When will I get rid of the trauma? When will I get rid of the insecurity, the fear, the addictions, the cravings? Just tonight, this evening, a fine young man approached me. And he described to me his youth. And his youth was very, very challenging here in London. I'm not going to get graphic or explicit. You will use your imagination. Extremely challenging physically, psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. He turns to me and he said, I'm 24 years of age. When will I get rid of the pain? Will I ever? I don't want night anymore. I don't want darkness. I want uniformity. I want that psychological euphoric utopia. I want to be able to come home in the evening and look at my spouse and just feel the endless flow of romance trickling down the ceilings of our home like milk and honey. A woman once told me, she said, Rabbi Jacobson, I grew up in a house of screaming and I decided in my marriage, in my home, not only will nobody raise their voice, but Bach will play in the background 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we will carry our voices so quietly, you'll always be able to hear Bach. I said, well, you've been married now 32 years. How did Bach work out? <laughs> and she said it happened once. In 32 years, she managed to press play once because the voices were eclipsing our dear beloved Bach. Rup Munka says, I came to a place where there's no night. The Alter Rebbe said, this is not your place. Because one of the most fundamental teachings of the entire worldview of the Baal Shem Tov and the Alter Rebbe is that Judaism never ever believes in amputating psychologically any part of your life, any part of your soul, any part of your psychological self. The journey of life is always a journey that must include all parts of me, my animal soul and my divine soul, my physical self and my spiritual self, heaven and earth. Ultimately, every voice and every thought Every experience and every encounter, every journey and every struggle is indispensable to my journey towards 
oneness with who I am and fulfilling my mission in the world. It was in the 27th chapter of his magnum opus, the Tanya, that the Alter Rebbe comforted hundreds of thousands of Jews who sometimes live a life struggling with battles, with addictions, with cravings, struggling with traumas and with fears. And despite my therapy, and despite mindfulness, and despite yoga, and Pilates, and gym, and weights, and kickboxing, and martial arts, and jogging, and running, and swimming, and dancing, and journaling, and running from one Kabbalist to another Kabbalist, from one website to another website, from one seminar to another seminar. Darkness lurks in me, and there are moments when I simply look at it, and I ask, will my devil, will my demons, will my skeletons ever leave? And the Alter Rebbe said, who decided that perfection means that there is no darkness in your life? Maybe perfection for you means looking at darkness and transforming it into light. Maybe for you perfection means looking at darkness and finding God in that very space, in that very corner, in that very experience. When Shmuel Munkus said, I'm looking for a place where there's no night, he said, find yourself another home. He said, I want your home. So the Rebbe said, I'm going to call my Gentile to expel you. And that's when he said, Rebbe, mein Goy is a sach starke wie dein Goy. What he told the Alter Rebbe is, I am not a man of denial. I am not a man who is dishonest. I know exactly what exists inside of me. And trust me, my darkness is deeper than you will ever imagine. My struggles, my challenges, I am cognizant of. I'm not looking for a Rebbe who will just close his eyes, make with his hands, will dance kazatskas, drink a lechayim, eat marble cake, jump up and down, feel holy, but when I come back to real life, I'm in the abyss, I'm in the dumps. I want a Rebbe who will teach me how heaven and earth can become one. I want a Rebbe who will teach me how to live with my godly soul and my animal soul. How to integrate my goof, my body, and my neshama and my soul. A Rebbe who will help me observe every voice, every experience of my past, present, and future. And allow me to live a life of real meaning, of real depth. Not a life of superficiality that demands of me not to recognize authentically who I am. A Judaism that demands of people to amputate parts of themselves or break themselves or deny themselves is perhaps valuable sometimes for some people. But Rabbi Shmuel Munka says, I want to be here. And today, when the greatest challenges that people have that I know is not from without. Your great-grandmother, her greatest challenge was hunger, hatred, violence, illness, diseases. Today we have those challenges too. But the greatest challenges that I find is people are hungry. They're hungry for joy. They're hungry to shine. They're hungry for creativity. People are desperate to live their life to the fullest. People are desperate for peace. How do I find inner peace? How do I find inner wholesomeness? How do I find a Judaism that elevates, stimulates, invigorates, inspires? How do I find a Judaism that shows me my infinite greatness, that demonstrates my, the love of God to me? A Judaism that allows me to elevate all parts of me and to synchronize them with my source. This too has been a major focus in the teachings of the Alter Rebbe and his disciples. And finally, finally, there's one major third point 
and I think it's best illustrated in that story that I myself heard from the Rebbe, I think, three or four times. And it was always moving to watch the passion with which he said the story. That Yom Kippur night in the middle of Kal Nidre, the holiest night of the year, when all London synagogues are packed, even Jews who don't come all year, but they come Yom Kippur to synagogue for Kal Nidre. And suddenly the Alter Rebbe in the front of the shul removed his talus, removed his kittel, removed his coat, removed his trimal, his hat, and he walked out brazenly almost, rushed out of shul, nobody can imagine where. They found out that he walked to the end of town to Liazna. He walked into a home. There was a woman who just gave birth. Her husband was very religious. He ran to shul. But this woman was desperately trying to warm her baby in a cold climate in Belarus in the 18th century. So on Yom Kippur, the Alter Rebbe chopped lumber, chopped pieces of wood into lumber, created a bonfire, lit a fire, cooked up a soup, a yoich for her, and gave her soup to warm her body and soul so she could feed and nurture her child. And then the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the successor of the Alter Rebbe, gave this perspective. And in my mind's eye, I could see it now. And I can hear the Rebbe's moving words as he said this. Kol Nidre, even the simplest Jew, feels a certain spiritual inspiration. The Alter Rebbe's Kol Nidre, we can't even describe and fathom the state of holiness that he was in, the state of intimacy with oneness. Every day of the year, the Alter Rebbe used to think and say, God, I don't need your paradise, I don't need your heaven, I don't need lower paradise, I don't need higher paradise. Ich will mehr nicht das dich allein. So many people, if you ask them, why are you from, why are you religious? And they'll say, Ganeiden, Ganeiden, I want a big chunk of Leviathan, of sushi in paradise. And Al Rebbe on a regular day said, Ganeiden doesn't turn me on. It's actually a distraction. I want you. I want you. He taught that in a marriage, you don't come home to your wife and say, you know why I love being married to you? Nobody makes supper like you. Nobody does the laundry like you. Nobody keeps the dining room as clean as you. Nobody finishes the entire to-do list like you. With you, simply, the quality of life is much better, even than the Hilton or the Ritz-Carlton, and it's cheaper. <laughs> well, not quite. Okay. <laughs> Maybe in the first week. But it's worth the money. And you know what? You really give good services. That's why I'm married to you. In other words, I like you because of the paradise you create. Says the Alter Rebbe, it's beautiful, but nebach, nebach, ay, 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 ay. You serve Hashem because paradise, nebach. It's nice, it's nice. God is a good cook, it's nice. Gan Eden is gewaldig. The tea and the Danish, it's unbelievable, Ganeiden. Whatever you want, you want Gemara, you want Kabbalah, you want mindfulness, you want meditation, you want a gym, you want a beautiful car, it's all there in Ganeiden. Mostly learning, but there's other stuff. There's, there's different booths for different people. Fine, gesundheit, hate, it's, it's not to minimize, but he said, I don't want, I want you. I'm married to you because I want you. I appreciate you. Not only because what I get from it. That's what he taught on a regular day. The Baal Shem Tev used to say, the Baal Shem Tev used to teach, a Jew doesn't observe Torah and mitzvahs because he wants to go into Gan Eden, because he wants to go into paradise. A Jew observes Torah and mitzvahs and serves God, and that is Gan Eden. That is the greatest Gan Eden, and it's even beyond. That's a regular day. A regular Wednesday, Yom Kippur, ah, Yom Kippur Kol Nidre, it was a gewald beyond. The Alter Rebbe Yom Kippur wasn't in heaven, he was in the heaven above heaven above heaven. 
And now I have to say in Yiddish. And in that state, Yim Kippur of Kol Nidre, Hadal Terebe get their field. Asadah Kim Petorin Vazdav Hobin Yoich. And in that ecstasy, he felt that there was a woman who gave birth and desperately needs soup to nurture herself and nurture her child in a cold wintry night in Belarus. He wasn't impressed that al Rebbe went to give her soup. Everybody here would go give her soup, I'm sure. If they would only think and they would only know. Problem is we don't always think. It helps. That was for the men. <laughs> That's not the miracle. The miracle is that in the heights of heights, he felt, he felt the pain of a little child, an infant, who wasn't his child, his grandchild, his great-grandchild. And he cast off the talus because he knew that when you touch, the ultimate truth is, Cook up a soup for the woman and embrace the child with love. In Kol Nidre, you will find paradise. In Kol Nidre, you will find the highest level of paradise. But if you're looking for truth, if you're looking for Hashem Himself, if you're looking for the raw core of Yiddishkeit, go out of your spiritual comfort zone and go chop wood on Yom Kippur. Which, of course, halachically was permitted and obligated because of saving a life and give soup to this woman. This is not just a story, it's a theme that pervades all of his teachings and how relevant it is in 2018, and I'll tell you why. I often have the privilege of addressing rabbinic conferences in America, in Israel, in other parts of the world. Rabbis, educators, lay leaders, spiritual leaders from all walks of life. And there is a frustration among Jewish leaders today. And the frustration is as follows. The British rabbis will have to tell me afterwards if this relates to Great Britain and the United Kingdom. But somehow I have a hunch that at least part of these words are relevant presently as well. There is a, a frustration among rabbinic leadership. Teachers, educators, teachers in high school, elementary school, Jewish schools. And it's one word. And the word is apathy. People don't care. As somebody once said to another Jew, what is the difference between ignorance and apathy? And the man said, I don't know and I don't care. Apathy. People don't care. The 16-year-old who walks into school and you sits down in your class and he goes like this. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. He uses other words as well. But we'll stick to these. I just don't care. But you're going to fail your exams. I don't care. My father cares. I really don't care. It's a different world. And those harsh words that used to work are almost completely ineffective. It used to be rabbis were proud of their synagogues. They would stand up. They had a secure position. A rabbi, I once asked a rabbi, what is your mission statement in your shul? And he told me three things. I hatch them, I match them, and I dispatch them. It was beautiful for a rabbi. Shabbos morning, he got up to give his sermon. He gave a class one night a week. The board made him a shiga, but the mission statement was clear. This is what you do, this is what you don't do. You put on the rabbinic uniform, you do your sermon, you say good Shabbos at the Kiddush to everybody, you try to make believe you're a nice guy, and try to be a nice guy, and be a good rabbi. And you know what? Rabbis tell me, my shuls are emptying out. Nobody's interested. We still have the older generation that comes dutifully, but they're 20 year old, they're 30 year old, they're not interested. A lot more exciting things going on in Britain. Even in Britain. <laughs> and here is, I believe, where this teaching of the Alter Rebbe is crucial for today's day. What the Alter Rebbe taught the whole generation in his teachings and writings is this. 
You can't only teach Yiddishkeit as a cerebral academic religion. You have to teach Yiddishkeit with every fiber of your being. What the 16-year-old boys and girls need more than anything else is passion, purpose, love, meaning. Teachers, parents, rabbis, rebbitzin, lay leaders, young and old. You got to get out of your comfort zone. Don't wrap yourself around in your talus of academics and spirituality. Look up to the heavens and say, Kol nidre, ay, 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 ay. Rather have the courage to go out of your own spiritual and intellectual cocoon and embrace those kids. Embrace your people. Tell them that you love them and tell them that God loves them. Believe in them. Bring out the best in them. Laugh with them so you could cry with them. Dance with them and sing with them. Be there with them. I was recently at a conference. Somebody asked me an interesting question. He says, I have a PhD in literature and in biology. I have a good English and I am groomed. And yet, I'm not very successful with my people. He asked me about another fellow in his community, <laughs> without names. He doesn't have my accent. He doesn't have my professionalism. And he's amazing. How? I told him, I think the answer is not so complicated. If you need surgery for a loved one, you don't open the telephone book and just look for Dr. Goldberg, cardiologist. You research and find the best doctor, not only in the United Kingdom, not only in Europe, but in the world. You ask for references, you find out people who were treated by him, and then you take your child to be operated by this man. Why? Because it's dangerous. You want the best. You want la creme de la creme. Why is it then that I don't know of any Jew who before getting on an airplane calls up Delta or British Airways or US or El Al and says, before I subject my loved ones to your flight, give me the resume of the pilot. I want to know where he went to school. I want to know where he went to grammar school, high school, where he graduated. I want to know how many times he flew. I want 10 paranoid Jews who flew with him. I want to know how he takes off. I want to know how he lands. I know plenty of paranoid Jews. Jew once told me just because I'm paranoid, it doesn't mean the whole world is not out to get me. And yet, and yet the other day I took a Delta. There was a Jew there who was mummish nervous. He took food. It was a six and a half hour flight. He took food for three weeks. I told him, why do you need food for three weeks on the airplane? He says, you never know these days. <laughs> the flight attendant couldn't understand. He had a suitcase just for food. Just besides his books. He had 30 books. A suitcase of food on the airplane. And he had to find a place for it. Nebuch. He was opening every compartment. And they didn't know what hit them. They never saw so much food. And I explained to them that you have to understand that by a Jew, a Jew looks at every meal as possibly the last supper. <laughs> so he never takes food for granted. Yeah. Why am I talking about food? What's that man? I forgot. What's that man? I never saw a Jew trying to figure out if the pilot is good or not. Why not? A pilot is less responsible job than a doctor? My dear friends, you know that the answer is not so complicated. When the doctor finishes his surgery, if he's successful, great. And what if Khalila he's unsuccessful? So for the patient, it's his gadal, for his gadal, shmei rabba. And the doctor, he says, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. He goes home. He still reads the London Times and sips his latte. He still drinks his pina colada and his hammock. And he goes back to work the next day. With a doctor, you want to make sure you have the best. But a pilot, 
if a pilot doesn't know what he's doing, I'm not the only one who goes down. You know why? If I'm going down, he is coming down with me. He ain't getting away with this sloppiness. Such people we trust. I told him there are two types of Jewish leaders. There are pilots and there are doctors. Doctors are experts. But they perform surgery on other people. Pilots. Join. They join, your, they join together with you. They connect. There's an integration. There's an empathy. Those are the people you trust. Says the Basayin again, that there is a moment that brings this out best and maybe captures this entire teaching. You remember that moment in Vayeshev, Yehuda, engages in a relationship with Tamar. After three months, they tell him, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is pregnant. He thinks she has violated the relationship. She was bound in a marriage to Shayla. He says she should be burnt. On the way to the stake, she sends him three items, a stick, a belt, and a seal. Who does this belong to? He is the father of my child. And Yehuda says, it was me. And that was permitted because in the laws of Yibum, leveret marriage before the Torah was given, it could be between any member of the family. That's the story. The Hasidic masters give it a homiletical interpretation. Yehuda contains the four letters of God's name. It represents God. Tamar is a palm tree. Dam Tamar represent the Jewish people, Tzadik Atamar Yifrach. On Rosh Hashanah and Yim Kippur, every Jew becomes one with God. Around three months later, that's now, now is three months after Rosh Hashanah, they tell God, Zonsa Tamar Kalasecha, your daughter in law has become a zaina, a harlot. Rosh Hashanah Yim Kippur, she was in synagogue inspired with Kabbalists and Achlotas and resolutions, but three months later in the midst of the winter, the Jew forgot who he or she is. So Yehuda says, Darizal says, Hanukkah is the Gemar Hadin. It's the final days of judgment from Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. If this is Tamar, there's really no need for her. He mutzes. She's being taken out to the stake. And she sends a message to her father-in-law to God. I am carrying the child of the person who owns these items. Recognize who owns this seal, this wick, and this stick. Says the Basayin, comes Hanukkah, a Jew lights a menorah. And he turns to God and he says, recognize, who does this wick belong to? Who does this seal belong to? The oil that came from the jug with the seal of the high priest. Who does Hamata belong to? Hamata, the numerical value of the word Hakeli, the vessel, the menorah. Look at the wick, look at the oil, look at the menorah, and answer one question. Who does this belong to? The one who these items belong to, he is the father of my child. The Jew tells God, how could anybody say we betrayed you? Look at this Hanukkah menorah. Through thick and thin, in kill Germany and in Bergen-Belsen. In free countries and in enslaved countries. We carry this light with us. Never ever say we betrayed you. Look at the stick. The wandering stick that Jews took. And traveled in order to preserve their faith and heritage. Vayakir Yehuda Vayoymer. Tzotka. Yehuda, God says, she is right. Ki alkein lebni. It's my fault. Shayla says, Rashi, Shiloh is Mashiach. I haven't brought Mashiach. What do I expect? After 2,000 years, Jews shouldn't make any mistakes. Jews shouldn't get lost. Jews shouldn't look for different places. But at the core of the Jew, you could see in the Menorah who they belong to. 
And in many ways, this approach bequeathed from the writings, from the teachings of the Baal Shem Tev and Chassidus, expanded our paradigms and taught one fundamental point. You have to know how to look at a Jew. Never ever look at a Jewish soul and say, he or she is a traitor, he or she is lost, he or she is alienated, he or she has chosen another marriage, another relationship, he or she does not belong to our people. Vayakir Yehuda after 2,000 years of exile. When Mashiach comes, Mashiach and God will look at the Jewish people and say, wow, after two millennia, of every possible tragedy, of every conceivable crisis. The Jewish people sit, light flames, believe in love, embrace Yiddishkeit, even if there are differences of opinions, and even if we're struggling with assimilation and alienation. Look at a Jew and celebrate. Look at a Jew and be thankful. Look at a Jew and embrace him or her. Look at a Jew and see the miracle of a Jew in the 21st century, may call himself secular and assimilated, but still wants to be a Jew 70 years after Auschwitz. Ich will sein I want to be a Jew. Can you see the miracle? Can you go out and see the miracle and appreciate him for that? It was this teaching that the Alter Rebbe turned into a cornerstone of Yiddishkeit, that today is what guarantees the success of every Jew who reaches out to Jews with love, with non-judgmentalism, with passion, with intimacy, with caring. The Jew who hears the cry of the koil yelet boicha who wants warm soup. They're not apathetic. You have to find the fire in you to find the fire in them and have then the ability to ignite it. And so, my dearest friends, I want to conclude with this little story, which is not so little. <laughs> I don't mean in time, I mean in quality. And surprisingly, it's not known among many of my colleagues. And it's worth telling tonight and finishing with this. The Balatanya, the Alter Rebbe, had a grandson, the Tzemach Tzedek. He was arrested 22 times in Petersburg in 1843. 22 times because of his dedication to Jewish education. Somebody once asked him, you might be killed. The Tzemach Tzedek had a half a million Hasidim in Russia. 500,000 Chabad Hasidim in Russia. You might be killed and you're abandoning a generation. And the Tzemach Tzedek said, the Talmud always likes to give two answers. I will give two answers. Answer number one, I have children. He had seven children, seven sons. Answer number two, the unity of Hasidim together is going to lead them all the way till Mashiach. The unity of the Hasidim will lead them till Mashiach. That Tzemach Tzedek passed away 1866, two days before Pesach. A hundred years passed. 1966, Saturday night, a night before, two nights before Pesach. The grandson of the Tzemach Tzedek who carried his name Rabbi Menachem Mendel, Schneerson was a Tzemach Tzedek, and the Lubavitch Rebbe carried his name. A hundredth anniversary, at the time of the passing, the Rebbe came down to Shul and held a public gathering of Abreng. Quietly and subtly, he repeated the story. My grandfather, the Tzemach Tzedek, was asked, you might die, and everybody will be left orphaned. And he said, two answers. I have children, and the unity of Hasidim will lead them to Mashiach. Astoundingly, even though it was not recognized at the time, the Rebbe continued the story and he said, presently, the first answer is not applicable anymore. 
what remains with us is the second answer. What remains with us is the second answer. We live today, my friends, in a time when the entire Jewish world is searching for unity. Every group, every denomination, every cries, every kehillah, every community. The walls of hatred and separation are not popular anymore. They're falling away by the sidelines day after day after day. A new, a new horizon has appeared, thank God, over the Jewish people. And that beacons to us the following message. The achtus von chsidim vet zedefidin bizbiyas ha-mashiach. The worst thing, the last thing, and the worst thing for the Jewish people today is hatred, strife, and disunity. All of the chsidim at this moment need to unite in absolute cohesion and integration. That is our eternal power. That is the most spiritual intimacy with God. That is what's going to lead every one of us to Mashiach. And it's not just those who are called officially Hasidim. Every Jew is one. All of our souls are one. That division doesn't exist anymore, thank God. It's the unity of all of us. It's our ability to connect to each other, to stop being judgmental, to transcend our self-consciousness, to be able to sing and dance together, to feel each other, to empathize with each other, to see the good in the other person, to see the potential in the other person, to see the godliness in the other person, to stick together, to be together, to enjoy life together, to cry together, to laugh together, to learn together, to dance together. That's the power today that will illuminate the entire Jewish world. Till Mashiach comes. And it's these three fundamental ideas that the Alter Rebbe gave us. And then this night they were authenticated in heaven and earth. Number one, don't be afraid of the world. The world is waiting for you to transform it. Number two, don't be afraid of yourself. Don't be afraid of your struggles. Don't be afraid of your emotions. Night and day within us ultimately must converge to create vayi ere vayi voiker yoim echot. And number three, learn how to love Jews. Learn how to see the beauty in Jews. Learn how to bring out the best in Jews. Let me go out of my ego and embrace Jews with my heart, with my passion, with my soul that can today revolutionize and cast an infinite promise of hope, of light, of love, not only in the Jewish world, but in the entire world. And the unity will lead us to the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days. And take it for me, Yad. Mamish, thank you very much. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.